Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, A Beginner's Guide to Conversion Rate Optimization. My name is Sarah and I'm the Marketing Manager here at Sarah Sagittarius and will be hosting today's webinar. Today's presenters are Ruth Irvine, Account Manager, and Lucy Beer, Digital Account Manager here at Sagittarius. The webinar will last one hour and consist of 45 minute webinar and 15 minutes of questions. We will be taking questions at the end of the 45 minutes, so please type your questions into the questions box within the webinar portal and we will answer these at the end. We will also share all of the slides from today's webinar with all of the delegates this afternoon via email. Now I'll hand you over to Ruth and Lucy to start this morning's webinar. Over to you. Thank you, Sarah. So hi, as Sarah mentioned, I'm an account manager for the web development side of the business and work closely with Lucy and the digital marketing team to ensure that clients receive the support from both angles of the business when it comes to conversion rate optimization, often referred to as CRO or in some instances, CRO. Now, today, Lucy and I hope to give you an introduction to conversion rate optimization and we'll explore what it is and how you can implement and achieve it successfully by your website or digital marketing activities and ultimately what good CRO actually looks like across digital channels. So to establish this we'll run through the bare necessities when it comes to CRO to establish what the actual basics are, the model and how we can implement goals and ultimately how to optimize through the path to purchase and to summarize how you can measure the success and learn from your results. So what is conversion rate optimization? Conversion rate optimization is simply a method of using analytics and feedback to improve the performance of your website by optimizing your site and increasing the likelihood that visitors will complete a specific action. E-consultancy reported that according to 59% of company respondents, CRO is crucial to their overall digital marketing strategy. And I, I suppose the key takeaway to, to remember is that a conversion does not necessarily re represent a purchase. A conversion can be anything from an email sign up, the creation of an account, someone logging in or potentially time spent on a page or download of a document. Conversion rate is relative to you and your business. So why is it important? Well, ultimately, getting traffic to your site is one thing, but converting that traffic is key. Decisions, as we know, are not made in straight lines. People bounce around and we let them. I think, actually, we encourage them to by offering insp inspiring content through blogs, thought pieces, white papers, social polls. The list, go the list goes on. It's impossible to be one step ahead of all users, so we need to think of the potential touch points to help convert this process. And here are some example customer journeys. So example one is Liam. He's 30 years old and he's an avid traveler. He specifically searches around um, hotel names, but he's still continue, continuing to look at other brands. So he's not necessarily brand loyal. And example two is Arthur, who's 66 and he's retired. He researches on mobile um, for about 50% of his interactions, but he actually goes and books at a travel agency. So it's important to remember to target him with research type content before he goes and books elsewhere. Um, he's also loyal to the brand, but um, likes offers. And then I'm going to look at what good Crow looks like. So we can look at benchmark data online, um, but we recommend that the best benchmarks are based on your own data. So what is the standard conversion? What went well and what didn't? So you need to remember what you class as a conversion may not be the same as other brands. So there are some examples of e-commerce conversion benchmark data available online. Um, you can get some of this data for product categories, but it's mainly e-commerce data available. This is an example of some different um, types of conversion rates by product type. So you can see the differences here. This is generalized though, and some niche product groups have a higher conversion rate, for example, electronics and computer software. Understanding your sector's digital maturity is key to helping you benchmark where you should be and how much effort it will take to really stand out from the crowd and shine away from your competition. We find that most brands are stuck in the first three stages, which is called the attract stage, which is where initiate, radiate and align sits. Within this phase, clients mainly focus on attracting more visitors um, rather than optimising the experience or improving the, the relevance of their visitors. 
The second phase, which is the convert, is focused on optimizing and nurturing. And this is where you're more focused on engaging visitors and converting them on or import sorry, converting them um, on important digital goals that will drive business. So this includes conversion optimization and personalization is a good example of this. And this is where brands can advance their digital maturity aggressively. Within advocacy, you're focused on creating strong customer advocates. This requires valuable customer insights across multiple teams, systems, and touch points. It's all about tweaking and optimizing efforts to become more relevant and personal. Now, Sitecore um, have actually produced an online tool to help you work out your digital maturity, and this assessment can be taken at connecttheexperience.com. This gives you an idea of how to build the people, processes, and technology you will need for the digital marketing success. And now we look at how you can achieve it. So throughout the presentation, we will look at ways you can achieve good CRO. But in essence, you need to tap into all areas of UX, digital marketing, design and technology, and the interplay between them. Unfortunately, there is not one simple fix. So how do you um, identify the opportunities? Well, you need to do this through testing and looking at the results and then testing again. So it's all so the um, art to successful CRO is regular testing and acting upon these results. So you can do this through A, B and multivariant testing, which most view is the, the most valuable method of improving CRO. The results of the e-consultancy survey demonstrated that 61 percent of people use this with with 31 percent considering to do so. Understanding your customers by looking at abandonment analysis and customer journey analysis, so what works and what doesn't. Segmentation to try and align email, website and digital marketing personalization. Take advantage of opportunities where they pre present themselves, so try and be reactive to things. One way to achieve this is through social listening and ultimately making sure that you've got the resource and planning within house to accommodate a good CRO. And now I'm just going to have a look at the funnel and where the channels fit. So the funnel helps us understand what stage our audience could go through. It's not always a straightforward process. So by understanding the journey, we can try and personalise our messages and goals to fulfil their needs. Funnels are a way for us to conceptually structure the touch points to make sense of the customer journey and to shape it. You can then focus the customer and dictate the conversation. You might not be able to control what customers do, but by understanding the process, you can influence the way they work. So here's an example of how each channel sits within the funnel. So social. Social feeds the funnel and drives new sessions, but it can also help with evangelising and sharing reviews. Paid um, traffic, for example, AdWords, so keyword searches that support the stage of the funnel. So someone could be searching for cheap hotels in London and others may already know the name of the hotel. Then there's remarketing, which can help bring users back to the site. This makes, um, makes the most of the traffic that you've already had and often converts really well. And then there's natural and organic traffic, which is great for volume and long tail searches and is usually of good quality. The website should also support the different stages of the funnel. How do you go about doing it? Well, at um, Sagittarius, we often look at the model. Um, or CRO is more often than not about increasing revenue. So how we go about doing this is a million dollar question. So we have tried to put together a model to demonstrate and visualize how this can be achieved. So with this model, what I'm trying to de demonstrate is how we can double the revenue of this business from two million to four million. And unfortunately, you kind of have to work backwards. So if I look at potentially doubling the visitors from 200,000 to 400,000, this will get me 4 million. But this is going to cost a lot of money. And ultimately, is it going to be good traffic? I can send loads of people to the site, but is it going to convert as well? Increase average order value. Well, we can double it. But is that ultimately achievable? Are your customers going to happily pay double what they're currently paying? Finally, what about conversion rate? If I take that from 1% to 2%, again, is that possible? And how much effort will that actually take? How much will you have to change on your website um, to really oh, 
um, improve that experience. So what we think is really about a combination, and this is where the interplay between UX and the website and the digital marketing team really comes into play. Because if I increase the visitors by 25%, my conversion rate by 25%, and then my average order value by 25%, my orders increase, and therefore I still hit the 4 million. So it really is about touching all of those specific points throughout the process to try and optimize the experience and effectively get good CRO. So now I'm going to look at goals and measurement. So um, it's important to understand when looking at conversion rate optimization where you are at and where you are moving. So goals are not straightforward in the same way that people do not behave the same way when purchasing a service or a product. So goals can help you track the digital touch points along the way. Choosing the right goals will help you validate and ensure you're making progress towards your overall business goals. There are hard and soft goals. Goals shouldn't just be about the sale, which is what most people tend to focus on, because people might not be ready to convert. But if you can get them to take an action, then you can help them onto the next stage of the process. You can also track progress and make improvements to help people move between goals. So a few examples of soft goals are page likes, newsletter subscribes, or blogs being read online. There are different types of goals and conversions. So you can have content goals, and that could be views or downloads. You can have social goals, so shares or follows. The problem with social is that it's some, sometimes hard to quantify, as conversions could be slower and really could be supporting the long-term long-term aims and there's traffic goals and then there's money goals so in terms of revenue or profit there's so many different types you can do which is why it's important to understand what you want from it and then goals help us to achieve so to establish and implement your conversion rate optimization you firstly need to establish your goals one define your goals so what is important to your business actions are likely to lead to a conversion the second point is to define your strategies Third is to agree tactics and your implementation. And fourth is to define key performance indicators or KPIs. It's really important to look at these on the short term and long term basis. And then the fifth is to deploy these through the appropriate channels. So it's important to prioritize goals and content. So once you've created your goals, the next step is to score them as, and to help you prioritize. It's important to understand your business objective and make sure that everyone in the team is in agreement. As discussed, analysing previous customer journeys could help understand what touch points are important. So Sagittarius often run workshops to help customers align the internal vision and help structure goals both on-site and off. By including the key stakeholders from across your business, for example, the sales team, customer services, accounts, etc., you get a clear insight of the needs and demands of the website. The next step is to ensure that you have the key marketing content to support the goals and that you can then structure these in a hierarchy of importance. Sitecore is an easy way to implement and test goals on your site. However, not everyone is on Sitecore or has the budget, so what options are there for those who haven't? You can always set up goal values in Google Analytics, which allows you to assign a financial value based on what you consider to be the most valuable goal completed. So this will give you an idea of successful conversions of goals that are not necessarily sales, but have impact on your revenue. And then goals, obviously about constantly improving. So once the goals have been established and implemented, it's really important to continue to monitor, report, evaluate, adjust and run again. This is how you can optimise effectively. Achieving the level you are happy with. So what makes you happy and what does the competition look like? Does that matter? I think also it's really important to add here that it's just not a one-step process. You have to continually be monitoring and updating and kind of listening to your traffic and what's happening on your site. I'm just going to look at a brief case study of someone who has evolved with digital. So in today's digital sphere, you need to evolve to survive. Um, look at how you can bring your product into the market in a different channel or a multi-channel way because no one inevitably wants to be the next HMV or Woolworths. So in 1900, the Michelin Brothers published the first edition of a guide for French motorists. 116 years later, that guide is now an online app as a world-renowned measurement for top restaurants. 
So Google Trends refer to the path to purchase from start to finish is rarely linear. It's more akin to a scavenger hunt. So let's just take a look at some example user journeys. So we're just going to quickly run through three customers. Um, and it, this example just shows you how clients bounce around the digital sphere and visually shows how decisions are not made in straight lines. So customer one's come in and he's had a look at online ads, he's bounced to TV and radio, um, he's then ended up in the store, then bounced back to the website, and then finally a loyal um, from the loyalty end side of things, he's ended up uh, signing up to a newsletter. Whereas customer two, he's again come from an online ad, he's, look at, he's looked at dig digital board billboards, <clears throat> he's then come to the store, back to the mobile, call center, and then email again. And customer three, completely the other side of things, he's come from PR, TV, radio, then searched for us, then come back to the website, the store, and then visited again on the mobile. So just shows that, again, decisions are not made in straight lines, and it is impossible to predict where people are coming from. So this leads us to the path to purchase. So Lucy and I are going to go through seven simple steps to engage your consumers on their path to purchase. So um, along the customer journey, one search can spark an entirely new idea or want, and one search can make the difference between your brand and the competition. So through this path, we will look at examples of ways you can, ways you can enhance your user experience so on your website and also optimize the digital journey to improve your website conversions. So step one is to consider your location and convenience. So consider targeting to reach people not only while they're on the go, but also where they are now. So highlight your delivery options in your messaging and be sure you show your product inventory online so that customers can easily see what's in stock and where. This is, in my opinion, a really great example. Um, me personally, and I'm sure like many of you, we're all attracted to decluttered, stylish, responsive designs. But unfortunately, there's no doubt that Amazon's altogether busier approach is optimized for conversion. And I think Argos kind of sits somewhere in the middle, and I think it's got some great CRO examples. So for example, in this instance, by entering my postcode on Argos' site, it tells me my nearest store for collection. That's if my, my product's required today or my next available delivery date. So it's given me, it's presented the information first hand, so I don't even need to think about it. I can quickly choose the, the right option that, that's right for me, and I'm, I'm presented with options, which is also quite unusual. And here's an example of a geo-targeted um, campaign for Argos using Facebook. So you could perhaps use geo-targeting along with promo codes to help you convert. There's many types of PPC you can do this with, and it really helps save money and works well for local businesses or places where there's a location. You can also find other targeting options, for example, weather targeting. So Google AdWords, you can do this by controlling adverts displayed depending on the weather. So mapping the effect of temperature difference against the seasonal norm on product sales allowed Argos to identify the following trends. So a 5% change in the temperature against the seasonal norm gave them 100% uplift in electric blanket sales conversions. So the conversion rate for sledges also doubled when it snows and when the temperature drops below 3 degrees. So on snow days, search volumes for sledges also increases by 300%. There's really um, a nice example for Brav Bravissimo swimwear as well. They programmed Google Ads to only appear in areas experiencing sunny weather. So the campaign achieved fantastic results with PPC-driven sales revenues for their swimwear range, increasing by 600% during a three-month campaign. And so step two is nurture the consumer. So ads don't always have to centre on, on a transaction. So be helpful, be helpful through the research process and establish your brand as a trusted resource early on. So how we go about this, um, content ultimately is a vehicle for inspiration. According to a Yahoo return on inspiration study, it showed that content obviously is a vehicle for inspiration, with 76% of people saying it inspired them to try new things, and 73% saying it opened their ideas to new perspectives. So how do we go about creating and making inspiring content? 
So these are our kind of six steps. You have to make it aesthetically pleasing. We are visual beings and we need to be attracted to things. So great visuals always attract attention. They inspire more effectively and they really set your brand apart from the others. Knowledge empowers, so recommendations, advice, learning something, interesting facts, news or updates. I mean, I, I know what I'm like, but if I, if I want to go and book a holiday, I would never book a holiday without looking at reviews and seeing what other people have said. Tell real compelling stories. Again, this kind of links back to the, the point above, but really ex explore what other people or what your consumers think, but kind of keep it to a bite-sized content. And show positive intent. Ensure that the reader comes first and not your business. There's n if there's no trust, there's absolutely no inspiration. And consumers who say that they trust the content are at least three times more likely to share it or feel more positively towards the brand. And finally, you need to keep it simple. Keeping content simple is key to engagement and sharing. So I'm just going to have a quick talk about cinemagraphs. This is something that we've been doing a lot for clients lately, and I think it's probably growing quicker and quicker. So cinemagraphs are still photographs in which um, like a minor um, area is paused and the rest is a repeated video, forming a video clip. These are published as an animated GIF or in other video formats and can give the illusion that the viewer is watching an animation. This is an example of how to make inspiring content and bring it to life and can be used for Facebook, Instagram and, and email and also on your website. So the key to cinema graphs is if that's showing in a social ad, there's something that moves and really captures the eye and is much more likely to be clicked through. And we've seen really good results using cinema graphs on a number of campaigns. And I think from a website perspective, it's an interesting way to kind of add visual harm. So instead of necessarily having lots of video, which can really slow down your website, if you just have still images with a slight movement, it can really make it look slightly more interesting without loading your website with lots of content. Um, I'm going to look at compelling stories. So as I've mentioned earlier on, by having real life images and social engagement can really improve your CRO. It's human nature to see reality. We're, rather than what the brand wants you to see. So plugins like Stackler allow you to have a live feed of social data on your site to help you inspire. Now going back to how you generate that content to, to inspire, you can do simple things like Trafalgar have done here. They've got their hashtag simply Trafalgar and that's how they drive traffic to their feed and it's a way to kind of control your feed. Other ways to drive content, I mean I've seen a really nice example recently where a company had created a blog post which was top places to take the perfect Instagram picture when in Rome, and then encouraging the user to use their company's hashtag. So this way, you help to drive nice imagery and pictures to the feed, you get people out and about in the city that they're visiting, and the user is generating content which ultimately helps you in your business. And then step three, expect that search will lead to a discovery. So as you refine your understanding of the customer journey, you need to consider the moments you want to capture at every step of the way. So think beyond the last click and try and understand where they're going next. And I'm just going to do a few key points for remarketing. So remarketing is used quite a lot within um, the company. So it helps bring back consumers to the website. And it can be done through so many channels such as Facebook and Google Ads. The content can be more relevant because they've been to the website so you know where they've been and then you can tailor the ads to match that. For example, if someone looked at the toys um, on Argos Online, they could be targeted with a toy sale or a product um, offer. The click-through rate is always better with remarketing as they've already visited and engaged with your site. So this is really bringing them back to hopefully convert or follow the next stage of the funnel. And then step four is to think about complementary categories. So if you think about your customers holistically and know that one search could trigger interest in your brand. So if you consider partnering with related brands in different but connected verticals to reach similar audiences. So for example, someone might like traveling, so you can obviously target them, them with ads around travel, but that might not be the only thing they like. So perhaps if someone likes traveling, they might also be interested in photography. So maybe target keywords around that. And then finally, um, expect that search will lead to discovery. So here's an example of um, some native advertising. 
So native content really helps feed the funnel. This is an in-feed example, so you can see in the highlighted image where the native um, content sits. It appears as natural content on different sites, such as the Times or Guardian, so people aren't always aware that, is it, that it is promoted and it actually looks like a good piece of content to read. Um, it's really good to try and get people to develop an interest and hopefully click through on your website. So the content is often quite broad um, and gives you an overview of what you're trying to sell because these people might never have heard of your product or been interested before. And you can use it to target people with similar interests as well. And then step five is prepare for the unexpected. So to do this, you just have to keep an eye on the customer journey and maximise your presence in those places where people may change course and consider related products. So um, tools that you can use to test kind of where they are on the user journey are things like Google Analytics and Tag Manager, Google Trends and Social Listening. So there's a lot of things you can look at in terms of your data to see or kind of gauge an, um, an understanding of what types of customers there are and what stages they are at. However, the ultimate goal is making it easier for them to convert. So on an e-commerce site, it's really important to do whatever you can to reduce the time you need to worry about losing the interest of your client. So minimal clicks and technology is actually there and cons constantly releasing ways to shorten this process. I mean, just take a look at PayPal with their one-click payment gateway that they keep promoting. And now, with uh, Apple Pay and with the card scanner on, on your phone, a lot of sites are now providing an option which uses the smartphone camera to shorten the process by um, basically take a picture and that enters the payment details automatically. So it just shows us some really exciting ways of how companies are playing in the digital sphere and new ways to challenge consumers buying approach. I mean, I know personally that um, I recently purchased a holiday online on my mobile because it was easier and I could, there was a really quick process of, of purchasing it. Another uh, thing to consider is in-store apps and you should all check out the 2016 IKEA catalog app. It goes one step beyond the normal um, catalog and features augmented reality so where you can see products in your home before you buy them. So you use the scanner on your phone over the, over the catalog and then use your camera and it puts the product that you're interested in into your, your home and it's a really good way of visualising it rather than having to make that horrendous trip to, uh, to IKEA, put all the furniture together and realise it actually doesn't work. So step six is not to underestimate the power of reviews. They're a massive thing in the industry at the moment, so it's important that you keep up to date with them. Um, they're um, really important in terms of the ratings on your website and the consumer perception online. So consider building these into your ads and your messaging. So if we have a look at putting this on your website, helping the visitor navigate and make decisions proves once again to be really helpful at increasing conversions and making the visitor more likely to buy. So 92% of consumers now read online reviews versus 88% in, in 2014. That's such a huge increase. And with 63% of consumers um, more likely to purchase from a site which has user reviews. So if you just have a look at Trafalgar here on screen, they have decided to partner with Vifo um, and have the full API integrations. So they have a logo displayed next to their key CTA, so up here, and this is a sticky now so it follows them down the screen. Um, and this has a, an embedded feed to the reviews on the page, so, what are, so that if you scroll down the page, if you visit Trafalgar, you'll see the reviews are at the bottom. Now, this is really key to have the reviews on the page rather than letting people go out to a, a review site like TripAdvisor. By embedding them, you're more likely to keep them on your site, whereas if they visit TripAdvisor, then it can link out to Booking.com or any third-party um, site. So you really need to keep them on your site. Um, another uh, example to look at is Fig Leaves. Um, they added a review, a review portal to their site and this simple change made customers 35% more likely to purchase. And I think it's human instinct, as we've already discussed, you really want to see what other people um, have thought and are thinking about the product before you buy. 
So there's also some more things to consider when using ratings to improve CRO. So it's not just about displaying the reviews on your site that can assist conversions. Having an API integration with FIFO or Trustpilot, for example, can assist from a digital marketing perspective. So organic stars, good reviews can lead directly into Google. With rich snippets, your service rating can appear in a, as a score alongside a star rating. So whenever you're searched for on Google, your listing will showcase your fantastic service, enhancing trust and helping to drive qualified traffic to your site. Then there's sellers ratings. So optimize your PPC ads by adding seller, sellers ratings or stars alongside your paid listings. These will boost your click-through rate by an impressive 17%. And in addition, the increased CTR can reduce your bounce rate. Coupled together, this is a significant impact on your AdWords quality score and reduces the amount you spend on your ads. And then product listing ads or Google Shopping. Use reviews to generate stars and help the products you want to showcase stand out from the crowd. So driving customers to your website and lowering the cost of ads. And social media and content marketing. Businesses that incorporate um, con customer reviews as part of their social media and content marketing strategies usually experience greater engagement and more qualified traffic. So with social sharing, your customers can become your brand ambassadors by sharing their experiences with your company. And finally, step seven, whether you like it or not, you need to remember that more people are using mobile, so we have to recognize the role that mobile plays in the research process, and you really need to try to orientate your messaging and targeting plans around a cross-device customer. I found this really nice stat the other day um, on the Telegraph, and it showed that the age of smartphones has left humans with an even shorter attention span. So the researchers at the Telegraph surveyed 2,000 people in Canada and the results showed the average human attention span has fallen from 12 seconds in 2000 or roughly around the time that the mobile, uh, the mobile revelation, sorry, revolution began to 8 seconds. So a goldfish, meanwhile, are believed to have an attention span of 9 seconds. So what can, we, what can be done to inspire and keep your clients engaged and improve your CRO other than improving your page load speed, which is equally important. So this is a really nice chart that we've um, mapped some of our clients, and this is their mobile and tablet usage from about 2000. Now, we often come up against clients who say their target audience are not mobile or clients browse, but they don't buy. But as you can see from this graph, this is just a quick snapshot. And within this, we are seeing significant growth over the last six years, and, the and it shows the importance of the smartphone with, I with iPads actually petering out in recent years. Now, this is quite a challenge from a UX and a producer point of view. Mobile is simply the hardest platform to design for because it's the smallest platform and it has the largest constraints, and there's not um, much room to be creative. Um, so it's really essential to establish your primary, secondary, and tertiary CTAs. So as mobiles prevent us with, present us with so many design limitations, you have to prioritize your content. Therefore, if you focus on the content, then you focus on your user, and the design becomes driven by your goals. Now, I've just taken a look at, uh, my, I would say, my top five UX considerations, and these are also tweaks that you can make to your, your website, so we're not saying you need to rebuild your website, we're looking at ways in which you can do simple things to improve your user experience on your site to help improve CRO. Now, I've just looked at some examples. Now, I think you all need to go and visit this site, it's called Navigating Responsibly. It's an absolutely beautiful site, and for me, this shows how clients need to beat the long scroll. So Parallax Design in the last, say, last one year to two years, the scene has basically started to dominate the internet. And it basically sees the background and foreground of your site moving at different speeds, so you get different layers of the background, so it really keeps your eyes engaged. Um, the other, which is really super, really important, is sticky navigation. So when I'm on a mobile, I'm scrolling, and then I lose maybe the head of the menu. So you need to think of ways which you can quickly get the user back to the top. Uh, so that can just be uh, an arrow. Or with Contiki's example, they've got sticky nav that sticks to the top and actually at the bottom. 
So with their nav, um, if you um, click on the phone, then it pulls down their um, telephone number and their opening hours, and that is actually dynamic. So wherever you are in the world, provides their local office. Um, and at the bottom, they've got contact newsletter and share, which is always sticky as well. So you've you've always got two options to quickly kind of head back to the menu or quickly share content if it's inspirational. Um, large clickable areas are key and that's why when I said there's not a lot of room for creative creativeness when you come to mobile. Um, if you take a look at Google's developers guidelines they recommend that your key touch point should be no less than 48 cc pixels tall and wide with less frequently used links being smaller um, and there's some really nice examples of this and again check out Contiki um, they've got a great example of um, a mobile site but also this one Pygmy Elephant I found this recently and it's really beautiful both on mobile and desktop finally you really need to make it easy for them to come back take a tip out of Pinterest and Airbnb books they let you um, well they let your visitor love like and share and finally motion and visual hierarchy so you really want to entice and reward your visitors and animations make the user feel much more connected and help breathe life and soul into the scroll and Parkour's Canada is a really beautiful site for this but as we spoke earlier on a really simple way of just kind of boosting your site slightly is introducing things like cinema graphs, social scrolling down there is a bit of movement in the site and unfortunately, one of the biggest things you really, really need to consider is personalization when it comes to optimizing your site. Um, and I believe is one of the single most things that really helps improving your CRO. Unfortunately, it's also one of the most difficult methods to implement, and it's in, but it's improved, it's been proved to be considered one of the most valuable methods. So for those that are getting web personalization going, it's so worth the effort. Two thirds of companies currently are undertaking some form of personalization, which is an increase in about 6% over the last two years. But um, personalization can take many forms. It doesn't just mean personalizing your website, it can be email, it can be search engine marketing. But to be honest, email, web, and search engine marketing seem to be the three main areas that need to be considered. So, with email um, personalization, Typically, we are seeing about 88% of companies and 92% of um, agency clients personalizing through email, um, whereas personalizing through website is the second most common method used by about 45% of companies and about 57% of agency clients. And that, those stats are taken from the e-consultancy report. Um, so you can see that actually quite a few people are doing it and that's why you kind of need to be a little bit ahead of the curve and start thinking about it. And that's why you need to personalize. With personalization, we often see an uplift of about 19%. However, Psycho have started to um, recently say that this is a lot more. Um, personalization allows you to define any target profile using behavioral data, purchase history, browsing interests. That's both offline and off off-site data so you can always reach the right people at the right time but again site court is not the only option and it doesn't matter what site you've got there are loads of third-party plugins like qubit can be installed in your site to help um, personalize your site so go and check out them so I've just given you a quick demonstration of personalization um, amongst other things you can personalize your site but I've just got a few Options. This is me browsing for a holiday, um, and with Virgin, I'm interested in a beach holiday. And because I'm logged in, they know my name. They've personalised the banner, and they've given me a nice £200 discount. So, and the the call to action is red. Really makes me want to purchase that, especially when I am on the train on a Monday morning, travelling to work, and I see it on my phone. So that's just an example of personalisation and why it's important. And there are a few other considerations to make when you're looking at um, conversion rate optimization. So one of the main ones is the roles needed. So it's all very well having a great digital CRO plan, but you need the roles to support this within your company. So if you take a look at this diagram from Cycle, it lays out which roles that you need and where to support your strategy. So basically this shows you 
you need the right people with the right skills in the right places to be able to support um, conversion rate optimization effectively. And you can see that marketeers kind of sit within the attract, attract stage. Within the conversion stage, you've really got acquisition marketeers. And then finally, in the advocacy stage, you've got channel experts. And you really do need the blend of people to really help support that. And then it's really over to you. So if you think about things that you can do or implement from your side, these are a few of our kind of key points. So what are your goals and why are you here? What's the strategy and how are, you, how are you going to hit them? And what are the tactics? What will you actually do? What are your KPIs or key performance indicators? And this could be short term and long term. And then what channels will you use to implement this all effectively? And finally, that's kind of where Sagittarius can come in to help you. Um, as you all know, we basically pride ourselves on growth acceleration programs and we've got a really nice blend here at Sagittarius where we have got the digital marketing team that drives traffic and creates raving fans and then you've got the e-commerce websites um, and apps that convert more sales and we go about this by within the digital marketing team it's mainly through organic search so SEO paid search social strategy content strategy and email marketing but this is always evolving in the way of digital and from a web build side we take in we take into consideration mobile UX and optimization global e global e-commerce and digital transformation I think the nice thing about being an agency is we kind of we're seeing what's happening within the market the trends and we can often help advise and guide clients on these so if you want to know more about us our contact details are on this slide and um, we've got a phone number on there as well if you're already working with us then you've probably got an account manager so you can always contact us to find out more we've got an office based in Ashford in Kent or we've also got an office in London um, and we will um, do free multi-channel audits and reviews at the moment. And finally, just want to say um, thank you for joining us today and um, we're going to go over to some questions. Um, I don't know if any of the delegates have got any questions, um, but I've got a personal question. What do you find is the most successful channel um, for utilising the CRO, for example, is online or social, for example, Facebook or Instagram? Um, I think in terms of digital marketing, the thing that really works well for us is remarketing, um, be on Facebook ads or for Google AdWords, mainly because they've already been to the websites, so they've obviously started kind of the journey in the funnel, um, and the second step is really to get them back and then to complete an action. So if you can get them back and they're still interested, then you've got a bigger chance of getting them to convert. Okay. And then I would say from a website and like UX perspective, the biggest thing at the moment is reviews and having um, Trustpilot and FIFO kind of in integrated onto your website. And that's quite, there's different levels of integration that you can go through, but I would say that that is probably um, the single simplest thing to, to look at. But ultimately, personalization, any type of segmentation you can do with your client base is really important. So you start targeting the right people at the right time. Okay. Um, well, I don't have any questions from any of the um, attendees, but obviously, if you do um, have any questions, then please let us know. Okay, so I've just had a question from um, Jessica Howes. Um, her question is, um, other than Trustpilot and FIFO, are there any other review sites that we would recommend? Hmm, I mean, generally, FIFO is usually our preferred one, but Trustpilot we use sometimes. I think generally it's best to go with the big brands because they're well-known and have the stats to kind of support what they're claiming. Yeah, and um, there are lots out there, and you just need to Google them, but Trip, we've got a few um, TripAdvisor integrations as well, which... They don't offer you the star rating, which isn't ideal, but yeah, TripAdvisor is quite good. And you can also do the um, API integration where you've got that in-page feed. It's really important if you're going to display reviews on your website, kind of try and splash out a little bit more to do the API so that you can make sure reviews it's really important if you're selling products that you have the reviews on the product pages because if you're going to buy something you want to know that it's been bought before and people liked it so if you've got good reviews that really supports making the purchase okay um, and we've also got a question from Karen um, regarding personalization what do you do if you're new to a market and haven't built a following so for example I'm thinking audiences you could build those is there anything that you would suggest to do that um yeah I suppose 
a workshop understanding maybe looking at your market, what kind of products you're selling or services you're offering, and understanding what type of people you initially, by instinct, think think would um, want to buy your products, and maybe doing a bit of um, brainstorming around that and working out how you could get to those people, what kind of platforms they're on most, mm -hmm. so whether Facebook is the right age range for your target audience. You can kind of start with your own instincts, and then when you've got data, you can tweak based on that. Google Insights also provide you with some really interesting stats on your industry and I'd say speaking to your peers, Sagittarius, which works really, really well, is our workshops. We basically come in and help brainstorm and tease it out of all of your, you know, key people within the business to try and work out who profiles and your personas and then once we've got that we can work back and see what goals are going to try and help convert them and what's valuable to them. If you're not already established in the industry, but perhaps there are competitors that have been doing it a while, it wouldn't hurt as well to go and sneak around some other websites. And if you can kind of gauge who they're targeting, then it's probably similar audiences for you as well. And again, it doesn't, just because you're personalizing, it doesn't mean you need to get it right the first time. Go with your gut instinct, what you think, look at your results, and then tweak and tailor once you start seeing the results come in. Okay. Oh, well, thank you, Ruth, and thank you, Lucy. Um, that's some great tips within the webinar today. Um, we will share the full webinar presentation with all of the delegates this afternoon, um, and also those that weren't able to attend. Um, so I don't think we have any more questions. So from there, I'm going to sign off. Um, thank you for attending. Thank you for listening. Um, and we'll see you at an event thank soon. You. Thank you. Thank you.